Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning, whether you are here in the sanctuary with us, or if you're in the parking lot listening on 87.9, or if you're joining us on Facebook, it is good to be with family, and it is good to be in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Just a quick word to those of you who might be watching on Facebook. I know that um, we've had some people that have experienced trouble with volume. So if you could, uh, make sure, if you can't hear me this morning, make sure that your volume is turned up on your phone and your computer, whichever one you're using. And if you're still having a problem, please let us know. We are working hard to address that and make this as good for everyone as we possibly can. And if you're here in the sanctuary with us, we ask that you would please continue to stay aware and respectful of the guidelines that are in place, particularly making sure that your mask is over your nose and your mouth. So thank you very much. I know it's not ideal, but we're trying hard to stay safe and stay together. And now for another, a few other announcements that are a lot more fun. Uh, Trunk or Treat is tonight at 6 o'clock. The children will start the evening here in the sanctuary, and Pastor Matthew will have a message for them, and then they'll head to the parking lot for treats. There will also be an opportunity for picture taking, and you'll get a bag meal to take with you that you can eat at your car or when you get home. So please join us. And while we are trying to keep this for church family this year because of the COVID problems, your children and grandchildren are encouraged to come and they can bring a friend or two with them if they would like to do that. Now, because uh, Trunk or Treat is at six o'clock, quizzing is at five o'clock. So if you have a child in our quizzing program, please have them here at five o'clock and they'll have practice then. Teens, you should sign up by next Sunday if you are planning to go to the ice skating and bumper car extravaganza in Charleston. And that's $20 for the event and for your meal afterwards. So please see Amanda. She has a sign-up sheet in the teen area, or you can text her or call her. Um, finally, next, well, not finally. Next Sunday, sorry, <laughs> false hope. Next Sunday is a big Sunday. First of all, the time change. So be sure that you fall behind so that you're not super early for our big Sunday morning here in the sanctuary. It will be our first Sunday with our Pastor Kevin Diatori and his family, Jenna and Maddie and Ryland and Logan. They will all be joining us for their first Sunday as our senior pastor and family. And we will have an installation service, so Reverend Trevor Johnson, our district superintendent, will also be joining us. So. Um, Please, if you are planning to attend in person, please let us know. If we would happen to have more people than we can comfortably and safely seat in the sanctuary, we want to be aware of that and be able to make adjustments and arrangements for that as well. So please email or call the church office this week if you're planning to attend. Also, if you want to be part of the pounding to welcome the Deatories, you need to have that money to Pepper or Mindy or just drop it in the offering basket as you leave today, and they will take care of getting that organized as well. And if you have a question you would like to ask any of the deatories, you can jot it down on your bulletin, drop that in the offering basket when you leave, or email it to the office, and we'll make sure that that gets to the church board. Um, finally, kind of finally, thank you to everyone who has helped, and especially in this last month, with cleaning, with sorting, with organizing. The playground got stained. The kitchen is almost immaculate. And lots of things have been cleaned out, cleaned up. Bathroom's got a thorough clean, and as we are waiting to hire a janitor, your help is so much appreciated and valued. Um, as a staff, we would like to say thank you to everyone that's been part of that process. And speaking of staff, Pastor Matthew has an announcement. Can you guys turn this on, John? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay with the mask on for right now? For the for this, I'm going to keep this on. Um, as you know, um, October is Pastoral Appreciation Month, and while technically, yes, I am the only staff pastor here, um, there are many others here who serve in a pastoral role, and so we don't want to neglect recognizing those who have provided spiritual care to this community. Uh, so, uh, Candy Shove and Amanda Adams, if you would please come up. Amanda has done a faithful job with uh, the youth ministry here, and Candy has just recently taken over the children's ministry as director and done a phenomenal job with that as well. So we just want to recognize them and their contribution to this congregation. Let's have a word of prayer. 
Jesus Christ, we thank you uh, for the faithfulness uh, of Candy and Amanda here. We just uh, pray a blessing over them, uh, that they would continue to be living vessels of your love and your grace uh, and your truth uh, to, to those in this community. Um, Lord, equip them, bless them, uh, and let them know that they are honored and appreciated here. In your name we pray. commandments 
and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except for the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Let's pray this morning. Father, Son, and Spirit, what a blessing it is to come before you in worship and in reverence and in awe of your glory and majesty. And so, Lord, in this, in this space and in this hour this morning that we give back to you, we invite you into this place. You are most welcome here. Lord, fill our hearts and minds. Draw us into communion with you. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Let's continue to worship our Lord this morning. Amen. What a beautiful name.
honor it is to serve and know a God like you. And Jesus, the reality is in the world that we live in, we desperately need a God like you. How everything from our bodies to our planet to every single nation is touched by sin, corrupted. Lord Jesus, how desperately we need you to be a redeemer, to be a restorer for us. And in that call to restore, Lord, we desperately think of those among our church family who need restoration, who need healing, who need a redeemer, Lord. We pray for Bill Quick and his injury and his brother Kevin with him, that they would know that you are with them this morning, Lord. Would you bring healing to them? Pray for the Nileys as Bob continues to fight the issues that he is facing, Lord, with his stomach and everything that's arisen out of that. Lord, would they know you as a comforter today? We pray for Esther, Athey, and her recovery, Lord, that she also would not be alone knowing your love and mercy this morning. And for Brooklyn Adams, she's confined to her bed. Lord Jesus, would you be with all of them? Would you ease their pain? Jesus, and the many who cannot be with us this morning because of their own illnesses or injuries, for every single one of us who have been touched in some way or another by this pandemic, Lord, we pray for them also. That they would know that you are greater. And that you are good. And that you love and care for them in the midst of their And speaking of restoration, Lord, we pray for our nation and the multitude of division that we see every single day. Lord Jesus, we have such an opportunity to be people who stand in the gap, who represents a God who loves everyone who died for everyone and who calls everyone to himself. Lord Jesus, would you show us how not to be beholden to any other identity than the one we find in you. Teach us how to be Christians in this world. We pray for our neighbors, all the nations of this world, everyone who is suffering from their own struggles, from how this pandemic has affected lives and families and jobs and homes. And we submit and know that you are a God who is in control, that you know better than we do, and that we can trust that no matter what happens, to us or to anyone else that you are working all things for your good purpose and glory. Jesus, make us your hands and feet, that city on a hill. Let us shine your love and grace and mercy and joy to everyone around us. Show us how to love our neighbor 
as you have loved us, Jesus. Teach us to be living vessels of your truth. We pray thanks and give thanksgiving to you for your provision for this church and Pastor Kevin and his upcoming arrival. And we pray for their family, Lord. That as you call them here and they make arrangements, that you would be over those things. That they find a peace and a comfort in making this transition, knowing that they are being obedient to you, God. Would you equip him and her and the rest of their family to follow you as you have called them, to lead this church faithfully? Lord, in all of these things, we praise you for who you are and what you've done, for what you still do, what you will most certainly continue to do into the future. Give us new mercies for today and hope for tomorrow. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Give me just a moment. I'm going to put these on. I don't actually need these to read, I need them to see you. The Gospel according to John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again through Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, worried as he was, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? But the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here 
when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then the, dis the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone bought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. The word of the Lord to us this morning, would you pray with me? Jesus Christ, we thank you for the words you provided us today through your servant, John. And we ask a blessing over them this morning in the message to us, that you would speak to us this morning, that we would hear from you your truth and wisdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, have you ever asked yourself in a moment of prayer or reflection why it is often difficult for you to obey the Christ that you follow? Perhaps you are one of the few who find obedience easy, though if you do find obedience easy, I would suggest you might need to self-reflect a little bit more. Yet even so, perhaps you do. So, have you ever then asked yourself why obedience to Christ is such a challenge for those around you? Even for followers of Jesus, we often find difficulty in the moment having to lay ourselves down in favor of his will for us. And it's not that this is an impossible task, mind you, for it's God's Spirit living within us that even allows us to be able to choose Him at all. Yet there is that ever-present lull of self-will that offers itself to us in the moment of temptation, however mortified it may have become. Whether it be a tickle, a dull ache or this potent desire of our heart. We face moments every single day that call us to lay ourselves down in favor and in obedience to Jesus. And not all of these moments, as I'm sure you know, are easy. 
It's no wonder then why so many people choose to live a life apart from Him. Because such a life gives us the unhindered ability to choose as we will. The stomach and the heart have a free license, so to speak. And it's perhaps what Paul meant when he said and wrote, Their God is their best. In fact, let me ask you, do you know why the true body of Christ has always been rather small? It's because life is simply easier when you don't have to obey anyone else but yourself. Even now, perhaps, You see, we're witnessing a growing group of people who accept the grace of Jesus, but reject the call to obedience. Something along the lines of, Jesus died for my sins? It's so convenient for me. Let me say thank you for one hour on Sunday morning, and then go live a life that pleases me. This is is exactly the phenomenon that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, my favorite theologian, I'm sure you know, termed cheap grace. Many conclude that because the gift of grace in God through Christ Jesus is freely given, that therefore it also must be rather worthless. People don't hand out valuable things for free. Obedience then almost kind of seems like a paradox to grace, doesn't it? Right? If God died for my sins and offers that grace freely, why do I have to obey him after the fact? That's not free grace. That feels like grace with strings attached. Hopefully you can see the conflict here. If Jesus and his atonement is considered as valuable as a free pen that's given to you by some company's sales booth at some marketing event, then how does obedience offer any value to the believer at all? And then if I do obey, does that not violate the concept of grace altogether? I mean, if Jesus accepts me as I am, offers grace to me as the sinful person I am, What's so wrong about me if I choose to stay there? This morning I want us to take a look at this paradox, this struggle between obedience and grace. And what I want to identify is its value, the value of both of these things that Jesus offers to us. Because for many, I think we misunderstand the value of grace that Christ offers to us and the order of grace and obedience in terms of salvation. And so whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, I believe the testimony of this Samaritan woman can help us all see Jesus a bit differently. If you would turn with me to John chapter 4. Now, as many of you are probably aware in your time within the church, Jews did not fraternize with Samaritans. And here's why. Samaritans were Jewish people who had married into the Assyrian people from the north. And so while they maintained all of the customs and the laws of Israel, right, the Jewish laws, and they followed Yahweh obediently. Pure-blooded Israelites considered them to be effectively excommunicated from the tribe of Israel because they had married into the Assyrian kingdom. Essentially, Samaritans considered themselves to be good, faithful Jews. But Jews did not consider Samaritans to be Jews at all. 
And so that's where that tension comes from. And so on their travels, Jesus and his disciples, they stop at a well that Jacob had dug, evidently. And he sends his disciples into town to purchase them lunch. And while Jesus is waiting at this well, by himself, a lone Samaritan woman comes along to draw water. And he kindly asks her for a drink. And suddenly we get this kind of beautiful conversation that unfolds about this woman's own life situation and who Christ is really is and what he offers to her. This whole kind of soliloquy about how what Jesus offers is a living water that would quench this woman's thirst and her just not understanding, thinking that it's some way that she can just avoid coming to this well altogether. And him finally saying, no, well, what you misunderstand is I am that spring, I am that water, I am the Messiah standing before I want us to take a look at some of the details that surround this woman. For starters, we see her come to draw water in the middle of the day all by herself. In that time, the women of the town would have done this very early in the morning and all together to avoid the heat and to have the water they needed for the day. And so obviously, this woman for some reason wants to avoid her peers so much that she would rather walk uncomfortably in the heat of the day by herself than get up in the morning and walk with all the other women in town to the well. And the question is, why? What is she so ashamed of? We find out later in the conversation that this woman has been married five times and is now living at least with another man who she is not married to. And here's the thing. I think we too quickly assume that this woman's shame is due to her sexual impropriety. I want to give you perhaps another possible way to look at her situation. As I mentioned, Samaritans believed themselves to be Jews, and therefore they followed all the Jewish laws and customs, as the Israelites did. And that means two things. The first is that if this woman had been sexually improper, had committed adultery or something along those lines, she would have been stoned. So the fact that she is even standing before you today after five marriages suggests that it is not due to her impropriety at all. Furthermore, we see later on in the passage that when she goes to tell the people of her encounter with Jesus, they listen to her. If she was labeled as a, as a harlot or an adulteress or something, that is not something the town would have done. The second is that Samaritan women had no authority to divorce their husbands. Husbands, however, just like the Israelites, could divorce their wives over the simplest reasons you could imagine. Perhaps she wasn't a very good cook. Or perhaps she had a really hard time bearing children. There's no children mentioned here. Perhaps the reason that she has lost five husbands is because they've divorced her for her inability to conceive. That would have been a great cause of shame for women at that time. The most logical explanation for this woman's, this woman's past is not found in her sinfulness or in her poor behavior. But it's found in that out of all her five past marriages, either her husbands all died or all divorced her. She walks to this well to draw water in the middle of the day, not because the women in town are judging her, 
but because the women in town are pitying her. John's trying to paint a picture for this reader's to have our hearts break for this woman's situation. And perhaps at this well with Jesus, what we find is a woman stricken with grief, divorced from a few of her husbands for her inability to perform simple tasks or conceive children, abandoned maybe by others through death or, or some other means. She's probably thinking about all of her shortcomings, wondering what value she has to contribute at all. And the man whomever she is with, gracious enough to take her in. We don't know the dynamic there. After five failed marriages, what does this woman feel like she has to offer? Yet suddenly, God appears before her in the flesh and asks this woman with nothing to give to give him a drink. Jesus, unlike her peers, does not condemn her or pity her for her shortcomings, her failures, or her sins. Rather, he offers her the dignity and respect that she deserves as simply a child of God. And he shows her just how valuable she is. Just how valuable he is. The Messiah. Now let's just say, perhaps, that she was sexually immoral, that the reason she's in this place is all because of her impropriety. Do we find Jesus come to her and condemn her behavior in any way? No. No, he speaks the truth to her about her situation. He doesn't neglect the reality of her five failed marriages and the fact that she is now living with a man whom she is not married to. But there's no call to repentance. We don't see Jesus say, go and sin no more, turn from your wicked ways. Rather, what Jesus offers her is himself. He commands her actually to go bring your husband here that I might show him myself also, just as I have shown myself to you. You see, the Catholic Church, they actually have a name for the woman at the well. And not only that, but they actually consider her a saint also. They named her Photine which is Greek meaning the enlightened one. Therefore, we ought to ask ourselves, what was it that made her enlightened? What was it that she had that no one else did? I mean, she can't offer children. She can't offer being a good wife to her husband, clearly. So what does she have to offer? Why is she enlightened like no one else? And it's because she recognizes the God standing before her. After this magnificent revelation of the Messiah that we have before us, this woman departs back to town, leaving her water jar behind. Quenching her thirst all of a sudden seems kind of not that important. And as I mentioned before, the people in town, that they listen to her testimony. And follow her back to witness Jesus for themselves. Here's what I want you to notice. Look at this woman's testimony and what she offers them. She offers them an encounter with Jesus. 
the opportunity to meet God face to face. She does not call them to repentance nor address their guilt or their sinfulness. She doesn't bring them rules that they need to obey or anything to purify themselves before the presence of God. She simply invites them to see Jesus the way that she does. And because of this simple testimony, this entire town comes to know how precious and how wonderful a gift Jesus is to them. Hear the words of the town in verse 42 once more. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. There are two principles from this passage that I believe we can apply to our own spiritual lives and situations today. And the first is how it should affect our own discipleship. You see, we get obedience and salvation confused quite often. And so when we hear Jesus say something, which he says very similarly in a bunch of passages, when we hear him say something like, those who love me will keep my commandments, or like the call to worship I read this morning in 1 John 5. We get that kind of jumbled up in our heads. We conclude that, okay, well, I must obey Jesus in order to love him. The reality is it's actually just the opposite. If you want to obey Jesus, you ought to love him first. You must learn to see him as your deepest treasure, the true gift of immeasurable value that God has given you. For what value does heaven have if Jesus isn't there? And what point does your obedience serve you if you have no love for the master who commands you? The simple truth is this. We cannot obey who we do not love. Moreover, consider the truth that once you love, that once your love for Jesus is made complete, how much easier will it be for you to obey? How much easier is it for those things to fall into place when Jesus becomes the thing that you cherish most in this world? Laying down yourself in obedience for the God that you love. Well, that doesn't sound nearly as hard. If only we could see how deep God treasures us. This is really the biggest struggle in my own life. I wish I could take my eyes out of my head and put them into your face so that you could see Christ the way that I do. As a God who asks us for a drink of water, who picks us up from the dust of the earth, who catches the stones that others would throw against us, who saves us from the storm, who overflows our nets with fish, who sojourns with us at every moment of pain and suffering imaginable, and who calls every single one of us to go and sin no more. A God who sees our depravity and opts to enter into it with us than to abandon us to it. To suffer beside us. To die for us at the hands of those he came to save. How can a grace that comes from a God like that be cheap? You'll find obedience much less of a challenge, I think, once you learn to love the one who calls you to obey. The second, then, is how we ought to share Christ with the world. Because if our obedience, right, comes out of our love for Jesus, then perhaps what we should lead in our testimony and our ability to share the gospel with our neighbors 
is not the moral structure and code of the Christian religion, but perhaps the God whom we have fallen in love with. You see, if we misunderstand this, this obedience to Christ, so will the world around us. And though repentance and justification and obedience are crucial in our walk for Christ, they're not the first thing. We're never going to be successful in bringing others to know his value if his value is not the very first thing that we tell them about. This woman is a perfect example of how we ought to share the gospel of Christ with our neighbors. All you really need to do is share the story of how you yourself fell in love with Jesus Christ. How he became the most valuable thing in your life. Correcting their worldly behavior, that's not the starting point. Moreover, which really is their greatest sin? That they're living with their significant other before marriage, or that they do not know who Jesus Christ is? So which one should we address first? We should offer to others the tender love of God that we have offered all seen and witnessed ourselves. The living water that has satisfied every single one of our souls. The kind of irony of this situation is that whether our desire is to follow Jesus, or our desire is to share Jesus, or our desire is to do both, the starting point is exactly the same. Love him more than you love anything else. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, we love you because you first loved us. Jesus, would you teach us to love? Would you teach us to treasure you as such an amazing, merciful, and wonderful God? A God who never abandons us, who is with us at every single moment. A God of immense, immeasurable value that we can freely offer. Teach us to love you, Lord, that we might better reflect that love to the world. In your name we pray. Amen.
What a blessing it is to worship you today. What a blessing it is to love you and to be loved by you, the God of this universe. Jesus, would you go with us from this place? Would you remind us at every moment of our communion with you that you are not far away? Jesus, fill us with your love that we might love as you have loved us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming. It was a blessing to worship with you. Please remain seated until an usher dismisses you. Have a wonderful week.